I wish to just ask you to reflect on this question and what do you think we should be doing? Do women need to put up with this problem and wear a path for the rest of their lives without seeking help? I'm sure the audience will say an emphatic no. If you say yes, then I will end up and go away. <laughs> so I hope uh, today's presentation you will find that it increases your knowledge uh, on this topic and um, especially the awareness. This is why I'm presenting on this topic. So my aims are to increase your understanding of the causes of the urinary incontinence, to improve the knowledge of management of this condition, and also discuss the advice uh, given by NICE in its latest recommendations in 2013, and also to highlight some of the polarizing views regarding the use of surgical uh, management in um, management of urinary incontinence. So the key themes of my talk today will at first introduce you to the topic and then I will just um, talk about the micturation cycle and discuss the risk factors and causes of urinary incontinence and I will also highlight the standard investigations that we do for this condition and finally discuss the management of different types of urinary incontinence. As you're aware, uh, majority of uh, people have the problem, but they do not seek help. And it's reported that three to six million people are affected in the UK, and it can affect both men and women, and it is an enormous cost to the NHS, as more than 230 million pounds are incurred annually, and also on top of this are individual costs. Prevalence is um, in 13 to 15% of women may have at varying age groups, with um, varying severity, whether it can be mild, moderate, or severe. And it can have a major impact as it can limit their functional activities, and it can affect their well-being in terms of physical health, social health, and sexual health. And there are long delays before women seek attention with this problem. And it's mentioned that a quarter of incontinent women may delay more than five years before seeking help. So coming to the maturation cycle, I just want to focus on the bladder and the urethra, that is the lower urinary tract. And as the bladder, so there are two phases of this maturation cycle. As the bladder fills up, then uh, it happens that the detusa muscle, which is for the bladder, um, will relax and the sphincter will contract to keep the urine in, minimizing the leakage. And in the voiding phase, the reverse action occurs where the detrusal muscle pumps and the sphincter relaxes so that we can pass urine. Then coming to the neural control, this mechanism is very intricate and uh, it has various um, nerves that, su that supply the bladder controlling the micturation. So we have higher centers in the brain, then you have centers in the brain stem and also nerve supply from the spine. So, there are involuntary muscle fibers, involuntary uh, nerve, uh, and autonomic nervous system which supplies the bladder. So we have parasympathetics which remain inactive during the filling phase, allowing the bladder to be relaxed. But as it fills up, then the other uh, sympathetic system becomes active and then it allows the uh, bladder to be um, storing the urine and then when it reaches certain proportion, when it is adequately filled, that the bladder stretch receptors will stimulate the pontine micturation center, which then is activated, which you will see in the next slide. So as the bladder fills up, the bladder receptors will switch on the pontine micturation center. And at this stage, sympathetics become inactive, which allows the bladder neck to relax allowing the urine to be pumped out. And at this time, parasympathetics will contract the muscle, pushing the urine out. And also there are uh, nerves which are under voluntary control through pudendal nerve, which again has to inactivate at this stage during voiding, allowing the bladder to empty regularly. And on top of the nervous mechanism, we have the muscular system in the pelvic floor. And there are a um, number of muscles that are in the pelvic floor. And these 
contribute to the continence of the bladder, anal continence, and also they enhance the sexual function. Because these muscles are wrapping around the organs, which is the back passage here. This is the vagina and the urethra. Urethra is a tube which drains the bladder to the outside. So all these muscles have to work in a coordinated manner to maintain the continence. So you can imagine that any disturbance along the route of the nervous mechanism or the muscular mechanism can lead to problems with continence. So coming to the prevalence of the lower urinary tract symptoms, the commonest symptom is storage. That is where um, it can lead to incontinence, urinary frequency, urgency. And then problems can occur during emptying of the bladder, which is voiding. That is 20% of women may have these problems. And some women may report of problems after they have completed the voiding, which we call as post maturation trouble. Uh, that is where women have completed the peeing, but then they have problems. So coming to the definition of different symptoms that women can present, urgency is where they get a sudden desire to empty the bladder, which cannot be deferred. And um, if they don't make it, that can lead to leakage. Frequency is where women are voiding more than often. So the normal voiding is about five to six times. These women can void more than seven to eight times in a day. And nocturia is excessive being at night time, when they can be for more than once. And urge incontinence is another type of incontinence where there is involuntary leakage, where the women have no intention, but they empty the bladder. And this is accompanied or immediately preceded by urgency. And then there is this condition of overactive bladder where there can be urgency and frequency with or without urge incontinence. And this can occur in the absence of infection or any other pathology in the bladder. Then we have stress leakage, which is a leakage which occurs when there is pressure on the bladder, which can occur during coughing, sneezing, or during exercise. And this occurs because the urethra is no longer well sealed during the process of normal activities. Then women may have problems during voiding of that they, del they have a delay in the start of initiation of the stream or the flow is interrupted. It's not a straight flow, but stop and start stream. And also on occasions they may describe a sensation of incomplete emptying after they have finished V. Then coming to the prevalence, in various studies, it's been shown that uh, as we age, this incidence um, increases. And in women uh, more than the age of 60, this may reach up to 80% that women may have some symptoms. And the commonest predominant symptoms, symptom is related to storage, as we know that this could mean that they present to us with urinary incontinence. And then I would like to just highlight some of the risk factors that are common in women with urinary incontinence. One of the important um, risks are related to BMI. In women with normal weight, the risk is only one in five women may have this problem. But as BMI increases, we see more women having problems with their bladder. And in BMI more than 40, which is excessive weight, uh, one in two women may have the problem with urinary incontinence. And as we have seen in the previous slide, that the incontinence increases with age, but also things like cognitive impairment or problems with mobility, which restrict women going to the toilet, can make a uh, contribution to this uh, problem. And in women who have had hysterectomy, there is higher incidence of urinary incontinence. This is due to the disturbance of the endopelvic fascia during surgery. And parity is when women have had babies that they can have problems. And this is more relevant as we age. So if a woman who has not had a baby, the risk is one in 10. But in women who have had babies, this risk can be one in four. And again, pregnancy is another contributory factor. Almost 60% of women may complain of some form of urinary incontinence where they pass urine unintentionally. And uh, at, by third trimester, which is 30 weeks, 60% of women may have this problem. And the most frequent symptom is stress leaks, that is incontinence during coughing, sneezing, or with exercise or movement. And this has also been shown that this could be a predictor of long-term urinary incontinence. Say, if women develop incontinence during pregnancy, 
it's quite likely that they may have problems in the long run. And in various studies, uh, this has been investigated further. And if women have had uh, antenatal, uh, that is, uh, stress leaks during pregnancy, this risk can go up to 60% in the long run that women may report incontinence. And if they have had um, stress leaks after they have had the baby, the risk is more in the long term, that almost 80% may develop this problem later on in life. And in women who have reported no urinary incontinence, these studies showed that 33% may go on to show symptoms of urinary incontinence. And uh, mode of delivery is another risk factor. And babies born by vaginal root will mean that mum carry some risk. Um, and forceps deliveries pose more risk than abnormal birth. And on top of this, you're aware of the medical problems like diabetes, which may lead to frequency of urination, or congestive heart failure, which will cause women with frequency at night, which is not urea. Or if women have um, asthma, which can lead to repeated bouts of cough, which can strain the pelvic floor. Uh, so there are a number of risk factors. So coming to the different types of incontinence that I will be explaining further, um, the commonest is stress urinary incontinence. It's the most prevalent form of urinary incontinence, followed by mixed, when symptoms are both stress-related, that is, leaking during coughing and sneezing, and also urge incontinence, which is accompanied by sudden desire to pass urine, which is urgency. So coming to the causes of stress leaks, it is because of the disturbance of the mechanism in the pelvic floor that there is loss of suburethral support, which leads to hypermobility of the urethra, where the pressure transmission is defective, and hence the control is not good, and women will report the problem. And then you have the primary urethral weakness, where the sphincter, which is at the level of the bladder neck, is defective, and women may have a combination of problems. So this slide depicts that normally, for us to be in control with the bladder, the pressure in the bladder is less than the pressure in the urethra. So this is causing us to be continent. But when this pressure transmission is defective, say when we cough and sneeze, the bladder pressure is increased. Um, and this exceeds the urethral pressure. So there is leakage. And also this highlights the importance of the urethra in the function, that we have the three layers of the urethral wall. Um, the outer muscle is under voluntary control, that this can be easily contracted. Say we get the urge to pass urine, but then the surroundings are not suitable. Then you try to hang on, and that helps us to hold back. And then you have the middle muscle layer, which is under involuntary control. And uh, then the inner mucosa, all that provides a tight water seal, helping us to avoid leakage, in, um, leakage when we are not ready. So then we have the overactive bladder. This can be wet or dry. And the incidence quoted is between 30 to 16 percent. And in one third of women, this may be accompanied by urge incontinence where there is leakage accompanied by urgency and frequency. And um, as, as I was highlighting, we have stress, incontinence, overactive bladder, then we have overflow incontinence, where the bladder is distended like a balloon, and then you have uh, repeated leakages, and this can increase the symptoms of the patients with uh, stress leaks. And then we have fistulae, where there is abnormal communication between the vagina and the bladder wall, leading to constant leakage. I mean, this is um, very rare in the UK practice. Uh, very commonly, we see in the developing world, when there is um, problems during antenatal care and labor, that they don't get care, and they go in for obstructed labor with large babies. And that leads to this problem of fistula formation. And so we see lots of such cases in the developing world. But the cases that we come in the UK, uh, we come across in the UK, are related to gynae problems, say malignancies, or trauma from surgery, or um, things like um, radiotherapy. All that can lead to fistulae. And stating that, 
this is rare, but I've been here two, five years now. I've seen two cases, and one was yesterday in my theater that I came across this lady who complained of constant dripping of urine. And uh, when we examined her under an anesthetic, because she had this impacted pessary, there was this fistula. So clearly, you know, it is rare, but we do come across now and then. And then urethral diverticulum is a condition where there is a punching from the tube which drains the bladder to the outside, and that can accumulate some urine, and women may present with episodes of leakage after they have finished complete voiding. Then you can have congenital anomalies where the ureter, which is a tube which drains the kidneys into the bladder, does not open into the bladder, but opens into the vagina, and that can cause leakage. And then you have um, immobility leading to functional incontinence, and uh, problems with the bowel in terms of constipation or cystitis can lead to temporary episodes of urinary leakage. And remission is more common in younger women, so that is good news. And it is more common in women who have milder symptoms than severe incontinence. And as women age, remission is less likely, so hence recognition of the problem and intervention at the right time in life will help us to avoid the severe forms of urinary incontinence. And also, there are certain forms of urinary incontinence which can be completely reversed. For example, women with cystitis. If you treat the cystitis and eradicate the infection completely, then patients may notice that their overactive bladder symptoms are completely cured. And similarly, urogenital atrophy. This is where women have undergone a change, and there, are, um, there is lack of estrogens in the body which lead to the problem of um, changes in the vagina and the bladder, and they manifest by urgency, frequency, vaginal dryness. All this can be treated because lower urinary tract also has receptors to the estrogen. And then we have also um, pregnancy. So the good news is women who have mild forms of incontinence may get better if they persevere with pelvic floor exercises. So one of the important interventions promoted by NICE to prevent urinary incontinence in women is to target women who are pregnant for the first time and treat them um, by master classes in pelvic floor physiotherapy, and that will help to prevent um, urinary incontinence. And similarly, weight changes. If women lose weight, definitely they notice a dramatic improvement. And we have had some women who were completely cured and uh, medications, alteration of medications does help because there are certain medications that people take for their hypertension, blood pressure, or for depression that can have an effect on urinary incontinence. And when specific treatments are instituted, it can lead to complete um, cure of th symptoms. So when a patient is referred to me from the primary care, we explore their medical history and identify if there are any triggering factors to their symptoms. And um, then you have neurological problems like mitral, uh, like um, multiple sclerosis, spina bifida, Parkinson's, where um, women may have problems with their bladder. And um, I recall a lady with Parkinson's aged 94 years, and she presented with urinary incontinence. We tried medications which didn't help her. Then we subjected her to the specialized test, which I will be talking. And then finally, when we altered her medication, she was all cured. So you know, there is hope at every age group. And then we explore the genital urinary history in relation to the duration of their symptoms, the activities which trigger their leakage. And many women come and talk to me that they're not able to do their enjoyable activities like riding, golf, or you know, they cannot play with their grandchildren or their own little children because you know, this can occur in all age groups. And uh, we identify their most bother symptoms and then treat them accordingly. Review of medications is very important because as I said, some antidepressants can interfere with uh, voiding, which leads to problems with uh, overfilled bladder, which then doesn't hold very well and women leak. And diuretics, which are water tablets, can worsen the problem because there is more urine produced. Similarly, diabetes, because more urine is produced, the symptoms of urinary incontinence are worse. 
and uh, also it's important to exclude other causes, for example, cystitis. So everyone who comes to the clinic will have a urine examination to in, uh, exclude cystitis. And then interstitial cystitis, where women have frequency with painful bladder. When it fills up, they experience pain, and their frequency is really troublesome. Some women I have known had frequency of 50 to 60 voids during the day, so it can be um, so severe. And constant, constant leakage, as I was talking to you about a fistula, that is one. And discharge and painful sex could be a symptom in diverticulum, where there is a pouch from the bladder or the urethra leading to this problem. Then associated conditions are very common, as we have seen. Pelvic floor um, has um, you know, the bowel, bladder, and the vagina. So bowel symptoms can be associated with urinary incontinence. One defect can lead to the other because they are all linked. And it has been reported that 31% of women with urinary incontinence may have problems with their bowel. And inner incontinence is also a reported um, symptom of women who attend my clinic. Constipation may worsen the problems with the bladder emptying as tools which are hard and impacted can compress the urethra and cause the problems. And then women may present with genital prolapse symptoms where they um, talk of a swelling down below and something coming down, um, a lump sensation, all that we explore. And sexual dysfunction is again a common symptom that some women may have. And they can report um, coital incontinence which can occur and that can be quite distressing because it can, you know, they can it can ruin their lives, and so some women are really distressed. And we take great care to explore the symptoms because you know it's um, such a big thing to come out. These anxious women are so embarrassed, so we don't trivialize their symptoms. I spend a great deal of time talking to them, building a rapport to explore their symptoms. So prolapse um, is a Latin term derived from prolapsus, which means um, that the organs have displaced from their normal location. And one in two women who have had babies may have this problem. And it's been reported in studies that 38% uh, of women may have concomitant problems that both can coexist, prolapse and urinary incontinence. So when patients are referred to me specifically for their problems with the bladder or prolapse, we give them an online voucher which is sent out to them in the post where they can access web-based questionnaire. This is what we call as electronic personal assessment questionnaire. So women in their own time can answer all the questions relating to their problem. And this will mean that they are less anxious when I see them. It explores in detail their symptoms related to bowel, bladder, vagina, and sexual symptoms. And this saves the clinical time. And then we can tailor our management based on their symptoms. So this is very helpful. We have introduced this um, last year, and this is really helping women, and they feel so happy that <coughs> things that they could not openly talk, they can talk on this questionnaire, which is then available for review in the clinic. Uh, patients can um, access at home, and that allows them to do this uh, questionnaire before they are seen for a clinical review. And, uh, so once I have reviewed those questionnaires, if women have not been able to fill at home, we have the system where we have installed in clinics that they can do this at, in the clinic visit, which means that they have to spend extra 20 minutes to do this questionnaire, because it, it is 120 STEM questionnaire. So it's quite detailed, and it explores their um, impact of symptoms, because that is very important. Anything that we do um, is important if it is mild bother, then there is no concern that you can persevere with um, conservative management. But if it is causing a severe bother, then you have to explore further treatments and go for them. And a clinical examination is important to identify any problems with their general health or with any neurological problems. And then I examine the patient, um, which will help us to identify any stress urinary incontinence. So stress urinary incontinence is a symptom which is reported by the patient and it is a sign when I can elicit during my examination. And also we can confirm this on the test that we do. I will talk to you in a moment. 
and also sometimes um, constant leakage means that women have been using pads to protect themselves and that will cause vulval skin problems and uh, vulva can get quite sore and this is very important when we see them, we discuss measures how they can minimize their distress and we, we assess their degree of prolapse and also any uh, pelvic masses or whether the bladder is distended. Because if there are any tumors in the abdomen, that will increase the strain on the pelvic floor, leading to worsening of their problems. So an examination will help us to exclude other causes con that can contribute to her problem. And we also examine the pelvic floor to assess the tone. And then, depending on the history, we may undertake neurological examination, testing their sensations and reflexes to identify any problems based on their history. I recall a patient who had a problem with um, an injury to her spine. Um, she was operated in 2008, but now she has manifested with a lot of problems with the bladder. And when tested, she had deficiency um, with her uh, nerve uh, sensations, and we could identify and do the needful for her. Then bladder diary is very important, where women are asked to record for us how much they drink, how much they pee, and how many times they pee, I'll come to it in a moment. And some patients have been so good, when they come to the clinic, they come with their diaries, so that allows us to manage appropriately. And urine examination is necessary to exclude infection, and if women have, com uh, have problems emptying their bladder, then we perform a test in the clinic itself, where they sit on a special commode, which gives an idea about their flow rates whether it is a good stream, whether it is a slow stream, whether it is a pro prolonged stream, and then we can scan their bladders to check that there is no significant amount retained. So this is the bladder diary. Here she records each time that she has a drink, and then each time she pees, she records the volume, she me measures the volume and records for us. And then she records the episodes of leakage. So in this lady, she is having normal number of voids daily. She's voiding good volumes. So the normal capacity of the bladder is about a pint, which is 500 to 600 mm. So she's doing well. So what she has is a leakage during sneezing. So looking at the bladder diary itself will help us to quantify her problem and identify the problem to manage it appropriately. So this lady has stress urinary incontinence. Whereas in a woman with the overactive bladder, she'll be voiding at least 10 times during the day, and she wakes up twice or thrice at night, and then she has a small bladder capacity. Like this lady has a normal bladder capacity of 600 to 700. The women with um, overactive bladder have smaller bladder capacity. Then I was talking to you about this Euroflows where we record how much they have voided, and then we have graphs to compare whether it conforms to the normal or not. Then, then, there is, uh, then this is a specialized test which helps us to assess the functional status of the bladder and urethra. It assesses the micturation cycle which is storage and voiding capacity of the bladder. It involves four stages where, to start with it is uroflometry, where she comes with a full bladder to the clinic and sits on the commode without any catheters and pees. Then we measure the flow rate and then scan the bladder to check whether she has completely emptied her bladder or not. Then this is followed by systometry, where the woman is catheterized. So a catheter is placed in the vagina and another one in the urethra. So this is recording the pressure in the bladder and also pressure in the abdomen through the vaginal catheter. And then it is hooked to the computer, which records the pressure in the bladder wall, which helps us to identify the causes for her incontinence. Then once, um, uh, during this procedure, the bladder is constantly filled with that bladder catheter, and this will help us to mimic the filling phase, which normally occurs in the bladder. Uh, then during the test, she does various provocative activities to mimic her symptoms of leakage. So the idea of the test is to replicate her symptoms. And then this is followed by pressure flow studies, which means that with the catheter in C2, she sits on the commode. So to start with, she sat on the commode without the catheters. This is with the catheters, she does another P because we have filled the bladder. Now we ask her to void urine, empty her bladder with the catheters. 
So this will allow us to measure the pressures during the voiding because this can sometimes be a problem leading to urinary incontinence. And as I talked, she will have a number of provocation tests. Like for example, a lady who reports a leakage during um, exercise may need lots of jumping during the test for us to mimic her symptoms. So indications of this test are when women have multiple symptoms, not only stress, but urge incontinence and frequency, or if they have difficulty voiding. And prior to invasive treatment, say for example, she has mixed symptoms and she's planning to undergo invasive treatments, then we do this test to confirm her problem. What we don't want to do is an unnecessary procedure for her problem. <coughs> so this is um, undertaken before any invasive treatments. And if her, um, if her urinary incontinence is associated with prolapse, then we may do the test with a ring in place so that the ring will hold the prolapse in place for us to get an idea about her continence after surgery. Say with the prolapse um, reduced, and if she's still manifesting with incontinence, then we may have to offer her surgery for her incontinence along with the prolapse at the same time. And if she has had previous incontinence surgery and she reports with repetitive episodes of leakage, then we subject her to this test. This is an invasive test, so we are very careful in deciding whom to subject to. And in women who have neuropathic bladder disorders, this will help us to identify if it will lead to any consequences to her bladder. Because what we were saying that this test is designed only for bladder and urethral function, but if we have identified any problems with neurology, which is leading to difficulty with voiding, it will indicate by high pressures. And in these women, we may have to do imaging for her kidneys. So this is just to go over with all the measurements that I was talking. Abdominal cavity, either a vaginal or a rectal catheter will help us too measure that, and then the bladder pressure, and then computer calculates the pressure in the bladder wall, which is of relevance to us, I will be explaining. And during the test, this will record all the events that we do, and we get a summary. So this lady had a good bladder capacity of 750 mLs, and she did not have any leakage. So not everybody who has this test will show positive signs. So this is very important that we take into account. And coming to the management, um, to first, at first I will talk of stress urinary incontinence and then go over um, on overactive bladder. So to start with, because every surgery, surgical procedure has some complication, um, we have to try conservative means because this has good cure rates. And I refer to specialist physiotherapists um, who deal with uh, pelvic floor in women, and they talk to them, they examine them, and um, make sure she's doing the right exercises for her to treat the symptoms. Then also we have to look into their fluid intake, because some women are drinking excessively. I have grown in tropics, so I'm not used to tea and coffee, but talking to some women in the clinic is, um, and uh, real uh, interesting uh, stories that I have. Uh, one lady said, Doc, I said, how many cups of coffee and tea do you take? She said, doctor, I can talk to you in terms of pots. <laughs> and she said, I take six to eight um, pots daily, and each pot can accommodate eight to 10 cups, she said. <gasps> then I said, my God, this is what you have to modify and you will get better. <laughs> then I had another lady who was a young woman um, in her mid thirties and who had frequency overactive bladder. And also she was obese. When I have given her the health advice, I talked to her about the fluid intake. And she said, I send away my children to school, and then I have nothing else to do. I sit in front of the telly with my Diet Coke. And that is what uh, it was the cause, because she was drinking nine to 10 liters daily, and she was voiding six to seven liters daily. So clearly that was the cause. And I said, once you modify, she'll be fine, and she was sorted. And weight loss is important. This cures stress urinary incontinence. And studies have shown 61% women who were leaking with high BMI. Once BMI was normalized, so many got better. And finally, the surgery. So in terms of pelvic floor exercises, NICE recommends that at least we try three months of supervised pelvic floor exercises, as this gives uh, good cure rates and is first line of treatment. Unless and until they have done this, I will not be able to proceed to um, surgery. 
And also in women with mixed urinary incontinence, same thing. We subject them to supervised pelvic floor exercises, and that helps. So in terms of um, use of devices for checking whether they have done rightly or not, is not a routine part of this regimen. And it will be all decided by our specialist physiotherapist. And similarly, devices to stimulate the pelvic floor muscles are not necessary. It's only decided by the specialist physiotherapist. And uh, these are specialists, they do a detailed assessment and she tailors the management as per women's need. She performs a vaginal examination to assess the strength, endurance and integrity of the pelvic floor muscles. And each woman is then individually given a regimen which helps women. So you can see this is the pelvic floor. This is you know, providing the continence for the bladder, the bowel, and also helps in the sexual function. So you know, working on this will mean she will have the benefit of improved sexual function too. It's very difficult for women to identify the pelvic floor because this is not visible to them. And hence, education by the specialist will help. Women learn to consciously um, contract these muscles before any activities will provoke le leakage. That is when they develop the knack, and clearly this helps women. And also they will guide them to do strength training for their muscles, which improves the mus muscle volume, and this helps to provide the structural support. And finally, the abdominal muscle training is again part of their uh, regimen, as this is known to increase the strength of the pelvic floor muscles. And uh, some studies have also shown that when the pelvic floor is properly toned up, urethra may also be compressed anatomically because you know it is um, in close proximity to the pubic symphysis. So when the muscle is contracted through volition, this may undergo compression preventing the leakage. So many benefits and cure rates between 20 to 84%. And the beauty of this is there is no risk involved. So this is why they have to try before we go along the road. So this is just to show you a normal urodynamic trace. This is recording the pressure in the bladder, that is vesicle pressure, and this is abdominal pressure to measure through a rectal line, and this is calculated from the computer, that is the green line in which we are interested to determine the problem. And during the um, test, the bladder is filled up. So this is indicating to you that the bladder is progressively filled. And she, she has um, various provocations with cough, and we record all the sensations that she perceives during the filling. That's the first desire. That when the bladder is filled, about 150 ml women uh, feel the desire to pass urine. And sometimes, in women who have neurological disorders, they may not have any sensation to empty the bladder. And then the lady has a normal bladder capacity, which is 500 ml. This is urodynamic stress incontinence in which the bladder remains stable. This uh, green line is a straight line and she leaks when she coughs. So this is very important that we exclude the problem of detrusor overactivity before we dub her as urodynamic stress incontinence. So basically, this condition is diagnosed by excluding other causes. Then this is a con um, this is mixed urinary incontinence, where women has detrusor overactivity, where, you know, from the previous graph, if you see, that was a straight line. In here, this is undergoing activity um, during the filling phase, which is unprovoked, and um, causes her leakage. So this is the leakage. You can see the little peaks, because um, that records the leakage that occurs. So, and finally, she also leaked with coughing. So here, there is no great deal of rise of detrusor pressure like here. You know, you have a good peak there. So this is a mixed urinary incontinence. Again, in this woman, she has to have physiotherapy before we do anything. So why we do not do surgery? Because there is so much in the press regarding the tapes. There have been multiple reports in the media. And this is the recent report at the weekend where three out of four mesh procedures that were performed in Scotland were no longer necessary for the women, it seems. So for you know, slightest indication, they have gone on to do it. And then there is this website um, formed by uh, women who are having problems due to the tapes 
that are used to treat women. This is messedupmesh.org.uk and this provides support to women and it is a very good um, um, site for various uh, you know, uh, resources that provides women to be educated on this problem. And um, in uh, June 2014, this was uh, decided by Alex Neal, their health secretary, that all the tapes are suspended at the moment in Scotland. They can only do as part of their research trials. So all this media news came because there were a number of uh, mesh procedures that were being performed all over the world, and all these companies were minting money, and um, all this scare came because there was this litigation against Johnson & Johnson where a claimant was paid 55 million pounds. So clearly, um, in the UK, there has been guidance how we do it, and when we do it, we have to discuss in multidisciplinary team meetings where there are other specialists who will see my patient and then decide that this is the right decision. So all the media scare has been more to do with the mesh that was used for the vaginal uh, prolapses. And um, this has created bad publicity. Though when we use a tape for treating urinary incontinence, it's a very fine tape. Though it is of the same caliber, in the sense it is a type 1 mesh, polypropylene. The width is only 12 millimeters, so about this much wide, and hence uh, this is less of a problem than the other vaginal meshes used for prolapse surgery. So we offer now surgical treatment only after a MDT review. So I do discuss my patients at Stepping in Hospital. We meet up once a month. There we have uh, other urogynecologists. We have urologists, three or four. Then we have a radiologist who will be reporting on the imaging. Then we have a colorectal surgeon because as we know, urinary problems are linked up with the bowel problems. And we consider women's preference, and it won't get passed through if they have not been to physio. And then we have a review of the traces to decide on their problem and then discuss the management. So the things that we do in our hospital are a TVT, which is a tape, which is put up um, um, in the bottom-up approach. So for example, if um, the bladder is this one, and if this is the tube which drains the bladder to the outside, the tape rests underneath the mid-urethra like a hammock. So when she coughs and sneezes, the urethra gets lifted up, giving her the continence and preventing the leakage. Then the other procedure is open colpo suspension, wherein um, a cut is made in the tummy, and stitches are made around the bladder neck to a ligament in the pelvis. It's an invasive procedure. Women need to stay in the hospital, whereas this can be as a day case that we can do a TVT. But this has uh, been the gold standard birch corpus suspension in the past. But since um, 1998, when the tapes have been introduced, this has become one of the popular forms of treatment because it consumes very few hospital resources because women go home same day and very good recovery. In two to three weeks, women are back to their work. So this is birch colpo suspension, invasive procedure where stitches are placed from the top to the ligament in the pelvis. And then this just explains the mid urethral sling, which is a TVT, where it is placed uh, beneath the urethra and performed through a vaginal route. And it can exit <coughs> either um, on the top at the suprapubic sides or at the top of the thighs. But these procedures are associated with risk. One in five women may have some problem. It can develop um, bleeding, um, mesh erosion, where the tape can cut through the vaginal skin. It can occur in one to five percent of women. Women can develop uh, overactive bladder symptoms after surgery, and that can occur in 20 percent of women. Women may have difficulty peeing after the operation, because the idea of leaving the tape is to keep it loose. But if you make it too tight, then they can have problems with peeing. So we have to get a fine balance. And women may have problems with sexual dysfunction, and it's a permanent device that they have to know because it can lead to problems long term. And but the beauty is that nine out of ten women are very happy after this operation, and 80% get completely cured, and even in long term they remain dry. 
So this is one of the other procedures that I was talking to you. This is a tension-free vaginal tape procedure, which is performed via vagina, but um, it exits at the top of the thigh. So this is, again, the same, another sort of a technique, which exists at the top of that. So we have clear-cut guidance who can do these operations. It should only be undertaken by people who are trained, and we should have enough of case load for us to give the adequate uh, experience and the skills. So each hospital will have one nominated lead. And in, my hosp in our hospital, I'm performing these operations. So if my colleagues have seen in their clinics, they will refer back to me for urodynamics and further care. And um, um, all of us have had training in this um, specialist area. And this was one of the areas where I didn't have, I originally trained in India, but I didn't have much of exposure regarding this field. So when I came to the UK in 2002, I had to write to the GMC what I would like to do. And this was one of the areas I had highlighted. And thankfully, during my training here, I got the opportunity. And I trained for three years in this field. And I worked with um, specialist urogynecologist um, at Liverpool, uh, Mr. David Richmond. Uh, if we have any complications to our patients, we have to report them so as to identify a trend. And if we are having a problem, then we have to go for for the training and stop doing the procedures. So similar to the drug um, side effects, um, we have to report to the MHRA with these devices, and it's an online registry that we can do. And in addition, I maintain a database. So all patients who have these operations, they go on a national database, so we can get our audit data from this site. Um, and this is all done personally, and I have to spend my own time after my clinics to do this. So this is the database where we log in the details. And before I do that, women have to consent. There are other options for women with, um, for treatment with uh, urodynamic stress incontinence. Some may not like to have surgery. And in such women, we can offer a bulking agents where medications are injected at the, at the time of uh, camera examination of the bladder, um, which uh, adds up to the bulk of the sphincter. So this sphincter has become thinned out. And this adds up to the bulk and improves their um, uh, activity of uh, the sphincter. Uh, but um, the problem with this is repeat injections are required and the efficacy may last for six to nine months and um, it is definitely inferior because only 50 to 60 percent women may get better. So this just shows you the placement of this um, agent um, at, at the time of camera examination. So this is the camera that we are doing and this is injecting. Other alternatives are considered in women who have failed, and one of them is artificial sphincter. Then there is a newer medication um, that is used for stress leaks, that is duloxetine. This works to enhance the urethral sphincter activity, but it comes with many side effects. And uh, one of the predominant ones is nausea. So NICE has not recommended that it is used routinely for first or second line, but it may be considered if women have multiple surgical um, um, you know, uh, comorbidities, which makes them a risk for an aesthetic. It's mainly used in depression, so, but this is the only drug available and licensed for stress leaks. Though it is not beneficial, some women may like to try. Then we have detrusive overactivity, which is overactive bladder, demonstrated on the urodynamics. When we come across multiple contractions as the bladder is being filled. And during the filling, we also do a tap test, which is to mimic her symptoms. Like typically, women with these um, problems describe that when they hear the running water, they feel their bladder um, getting, you know, that urge to empty the bladder. Or um, on occasions, uh, when the filling is taking up with a cold fluid that we are filling the bladder, that can provoke. And it can be, most commonly, it is idiopathic, where there is no explanation. But it can be neurogenic. We saw the neural control of the filling, so if a woman has had a stroke, then the uh, voluntary control is gone, and they go on to have uh, the problem with overactive bladder. And as we have discussed before, it increases with age, and more women than men. And as you're aware, men do not have babies, so urinary incontinence is more common in women. And other in investigations may be indicated in these conditions if it has come on acutely. Most often, urinary incontinence is presenting gradually. If it comes on acutely, we have to exclude causes like bladder cancer or 
a stone in the bladder, and hence a camera examination, which is cystoscopy, may be necessary or imaging. So this shows up the detrusor contraction during our test of urodynamics. Normally, it should have been a straight line. So this is accompanied by an urgent desire to pass urine. And however uh, much she tries, she cannot hold it. Th this is beyond control, and this provokes the leakage. And uh, one of the other things that I was telling you, that the bladder capacity is very small. And look at this. This is 145. So it's a small bladder, because repeatedly she has the leakages, and hence bladder gets into that mode that it doesn't fill up. And um, in this condition, again, to start with, lifestyle interventions are very important. You have to educate them about their fluid intake. They have to avoid the irritant fluids. And some women may say alcohol may irritate, and they have to restrict the intake of alcohol, and similarly, caffeine. And the AMI has to be targeted. They have to lose weight. That can improve their bladder symptoms. And uh, there is role of local estrogens, as I was telling that many women may have around the time of their menopause or post-menopause, and this can be easily treated by vaginal tablets. So bladder training is very crucial in this condition, that they have to work on it. So if she's you know, um, practicing this, this can lead to a great deal of difference in her symptoms. And on top of it, some women may come to need medications. Together, it works better, and then there is less relapse rate. Otherwise, when she stops the tablets, then it can come back the same problem. Um, this is an effective treatment, and um, you know, and uh, this is what women have to realize that they have to work together with our medication. It just medication will not help otherwise. <coughs> so I see that continence advisors are very helpful in helping women to um, practice bladder training. So we try different tablets. These are anticholinergics. They target the receptors in the bladder. They block the receptors, which then helps to make the bladder accommodate more of urine, preventing the urge to empty the bladder. All the tablets have similar um, efficacy. Their adverse effects may di differ depending on the receptors. We were talking about this parasympathetic, uh, these receptors. They are not only in the bladder, but they occur elsewhere in the body. And hence, these women may experience side effects related to the receptors in other parts of the body. So they may have a dry mouth, dry eyes, they may feel fatigued, and they may feel you know, sleepiness, and all these are because it's working elsewhere too. Because we don't have a selective, clearly selective. There are some newer medications which can be a bit selective, but then you know, the side effects are still seen. And uh, most often we use tablets, but in women who have cognitive impairment, if they are uh, not able to take tablets, then we have some patches available of oxybutynin. This is the oxybutynin, which is recommended by NICE as a form of treatment, and very, um, uh, you know, it's uh, very cost effective. But because of the side effect profile, one in four women will discontinue. Then there are second line of medications, and early treatment review is recommended once any treatments are given between four to six weeks to see how she's responding, whether she's experiencing any side effects. And if she's experiencing side effects, then we alter the medication. And most often, um, what we would like our GPs to do is to start in the primary care, because this is all part of the continence care. And they started the um, primary care, and they can try two medications. If they don't respond, then they can send to us so that we can go on to investigate further. Uh, Desmopressin is another tablet which will help to treat nocturia in women. And this works through pituitary mechanism, and it produces less V at night, and hence women are drier. Because it can be quite distressing at women, as women get up through the night and they get very tired. Um, many people ask me whether HRT is useful in the treatment. Not exactly from the studies, but definitely local estrogens are very helpful in overactive bladder. And I give away many prescriptions in my clinic with this. And there are now new medications that has arrived in the market since last year, and NICE has given the uh, go ahead with this medication, but uh, not as a first line, but then if they have tried anti clinics, if they have not responded, then this is Mirabegron. It helps to relax the bladder muscle so that it can fill up and can store more urine, preventing the leakage. Um, side effects are it can cause some cystitis or palpitations. Then we have intravesical Botox therapy. 
if women have taken medications and they're experiencing very bad side effects, then we offer them intravesical therapy, which is injection of the Botox into the bladder, which helps to block the release of the neurotransmitter, and hence, basically, the bladder undergoes a bit of paralysis, so it can hold more urine, and that's, that helps to prevent leakages. And this, again, is not a permanent um, therapy, and they may need repeat injections. It has few side effects, and one of them is um, injection site pain, infections, and voiding difficulties.